Now is the turning point. So as you can see, it's imperative to protect the Arctic, specifically because of its unique importance to wildlife, and it's crucial to do so now because of the current fragility of the situation. This brings us to the third level of analysis. Why inherently exploitation of Arctic resources destroys the region? Now, thank you, ma'am. Arctic, Arctic, Arctic weather is so extreme and unpredictable that it's practically impossible to contend with. Now, opposition is going to tell you about how we have lots and lots of ways of mitigating disasters and lots of regulation. We say this does not stand, and I'll tell you why. Shell, after having invested billions of dollars in new technology and new infrastructure, declared itself Arctic ready at the beginning of 2012. They passed the necessary regulations. Then the following things happened. They lost control of two rigs. Their containment vessels failed and were crushed by pressures lower than those in the Arctic. Their oral response barge failed drastically in a routine test. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a company that is Arctic ready. The former CEO of French oil giant Total said the following. It is the height of hubris to presume that we can really contend with Arctic conditions. We just don't have the physical yeah. Yeah. capability, and that is the reality. End quote. A reality, ladies and gentlemen, that led the U.S. Minerals Management Service to estimate a 1 in 5 chance of a major spill in the Arctic Ocean. Worse, ladies and gentlemen, if there were to be a spill, we simply don't have the adequate cleanup technologies. A report released by the U.S. Accountability yeah. Office explains that should a spill happen in the winter, oil can become trapped under ice, kilometers underneath ice fragments, and travel miles before it's released in the summer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, even if we could mitigate the chances of a spill, which of course we can't, drilling in the Arctic involves not just oil rigs. There's a whole infrastructure that has to be built. Roads, gravel mines, housing, pipelines, support facilities, and airports. This results in the destruction of habitats, fragmentation of migration routes, etc., and is also fundamentally inextricable from resource exploitation. It's just unavoidable that we have to build these things, and irrefutable that they harm wildlife. But even if we have no care whatsoever for the environmental implications and are entirely selfish, we still should not drill in the Arctic. And this brings me on to my second point, the impact on human populations. So we have two issues. Firstly, the direct effect on sea rising sea levels, and secondly, the impact on local populations. So firstly, drilling in the Arctic melts polar ice fast. This is true for two reasons. Firstly, fragmented ice melts more quickly, and drilling, as you can imagine, fragments ice. Secondly, and slightly more complex, is the fact that the Arctic reserves contain also natural gas and not only oil. Now, we cannot exploit the natural gas because it needs to be processed onshore in a process that's much too expensive for the oil companies to have any interest in doing. So we have two choices, either release it into the atmosphere, which is incredibly harmful, or burn the gas as it emerges in what is called flares. And this is what is currently done. The flares produce soot, which is directly released onto the ice, leading the ice to absorb more heat and therefore to melt much faster. The melting of the ice causes harms we are all aware of. Rising sea levels are a major global concern, specifically to coastal communities. If the sea level rises just 200 millimeters, something that, current rates will ha that at current rates will happen in 25 years, there would be approximately 170,000 170, homeless, pe homeless people in Nigeria alone. Sound opposition in this space has to tell us why they're prepared for this to happen. But not only do we raise sea levels and harm coastal, coastal communities, as also, we also harm indigenous Arctic communities. The last major tribal council actively opposes any development in Anwar. They are begging their government not to allow oil giants to displace their traditional communities, uproot their people, and devastate their livelihoods. They have a right to their homes. And this, ladies and gentlemen, drilling the Arctic, Arctic is a basic Aboriginal human rights issue. So because we cannot exploit resources without massively harming the crucial and unique Arctic environment, and because we furthermore harm human populations, we cannot continue this devastating practice. Thank you.
This is why we inside opposition believe in the extraction of resources from the Arctic in order to supply energy to people who are currently living in energy poverty. And we're going to prove this to you through four substantive points. That one, the need for power is urgent. Two, there, there's a need for resources in the Arctic. And three, the option of green energy is not open for developing countries. And four, that extracting resources will not deter innovation from green energy. But before I move on to my substantive point, I have four rebuttals in today's debate. On the first rebuttal, she talked about this idea of how there's other alternatives towards this energy crisis. On the first, or on the first level of analysis, we can see that renewable energy is what we want in this debate, but the question is, is that renewable energy is not ready yet. We talk about how there's already a high cost of renewable energy, and also, second of all, there's an inefficiency of renewable energy. On this idea of cost, ladies and gentlemen, in the United States, Solyndra, which is a solar energy company, went bankrupt, even though the United States supplied $535 million in subsidies. This shows how developing countries cannot actually can, uh, cannot afford the high cost when countries like the United States has a, when countries like the United States has already a high cost in the terms of renewable energy. But second of all, on this idea of efficiency, because we think that efficiency the efficiency of renewable energy is not there yet because it means that these countries cannot supply enough energy towards their own population where there's a high where there's a low energy capacity in production we talk about how brazil where the major source of energy is hydroelectric dams because it depends on the weather and when there's a low shortage of rainfall we think that countries like brazil are actually looking towards power rationing because there's not enough energy from renewable energy the burden that side proposition has to prove in today's debate is how countries Countries like China and India can move towards renewable energy when countries like the United States is still having problems with this idea of renewable energy. What they're doing is supporting the inequality of the poor and rich nations because we simply think that developing nations do not have the funding yet. But on the second level of analysis, because we don't think that this is an option between renewable energy and this idea of fossil fuels, because we think that when what happens when you don't allow when you don't allow countries to actually extract resources from the Arctic is that you're forcing China to actually move towards unenvironmentally friendly drilling. This is because China is going to be forced to actually drill in unconventional preserves where they're going to use fracking, which is a method of actually making the water more toxic and making uh, making water contamination in the region. And we think that this is going to be a big issue. But moving on to the second rebuttal on this idea of the harms to the environment. On the first level of analysis, they never, they never really showed the logic behind this. But first of all, we want to tell you that there's a moral responsibility to people in need, such as people in China and India. And this is why we think that the world has already moved towards environmentally friendly drilling. Because first of all, companies do know the risks, such as when, such as when the BP oil spill happened, they had to pay $14 billion after the oil spill. So of course they're not going to simply go into the Arctic and cause an oil spill because they know that there's a high environmental cost. It means that they're going to develop they're going to develop technology that is going to be more environmentally friendly. But second of all, there's a political will to develop environmentally friendly technology. We think that $726 million has been spent on lobbying the Washington government in order to make sure that there's going to be regulations in oil drilling. But also moving on to the third on, on the third rebuttal, how she talked about this idea of safety, how the Arctic is very cold. On the first level of analysis, we think that regulations can be strengthened on our side because the examples that get talked about are simply tests. And we think that this is when we can ensure safety regulations in the future because we think that when mistakes happen, it means that companies can take that into account and ensure that it's going to be more safer in the future. But on the second level of analysis, we think that in the we think that there's a similar example to the Arctic in the North Sea, where there are hazardous conditions when it is very cold. We think that already more than half of the oil reserves has been extracted, where companies from Britain and Norway has already made sure that there's going to be enough safety regulations, so we don't see any problem with actually extracting resources from the Arctic. So moving on to my mechanism in today's debate. That first of all, we think that the five Arctic nations, such as Russia, the United States, Canada, Greenland, and Norway, will come together through the Arctic Council to cooperate in, first of all, producing hydrographic data and charting, second of all, harmonization, of regulatory shipping guidelines and tree, establishing search and rescue capability in the region in order to know how to address stranded ships or ships that hit icebergs. 
Second of all, we're going to attach a precondition to oil drill drilling licenses that companies extracting resources in the Arctic have to fund the indigenous people in terms of infrastructure and employment. Because we think that people living in that area are actually very food insecure, where 56% do not have access to food. So we do see that there's an incentive for actually helping those people. But before I move on. What about all those people that you're going to be displacing by the water that you're listening Ladies and gentlemen, we think that that's a long-term problem. We think that the idea of global warming is going to happen on your side because you're going to burn fossil fuels as well, and that is going to be the result, that's going to be the consequence of global warming as well. But moving on to the first substantive point, that the need for power is urgent. Because we think that energy access is a prerequisite to human rights, where access to clean water depends on energy. We think that the Millennium Development Goal of the United Nations Development Program has as a target of reducing by half the number of people without access to clean water. We think that this can only be solved by installing one million electric pumps. But we also think that this argument extends to other se sectors like healthcare, where it's not possible to actually store vaccines or other vital medicines or operate a modern healthcare facility without electricity. And this is why we need to make sure that countries like China and India are going to get these necessary resources. But on the second substantive point, because we think that there's a need of resources in the Arctic region. Where there are 90 billion barrels of oil in the Arctic region, it means that we can actually su supply the world three years of the global oil supply. And this is why resources in the Arctic are for usage and not present for preservation. And this is why we think that we can actually extract these natural resources with environmentally friendly measures such as directional drilling, which is drilling wells at different angles and tapping resources miles and below from the surface. And this is why we think that the fluid used in directional dr drilling is actually made of clay and water, which is non-toxic and actually, and actually easy to dispose of. We also think that it's going to be easier to clean off the mess because we think that the Cold Region Research Engineering Lab in December found out that the ice can act as a natural boom that prevents oil from spreading over vast distances. So this is why we don't see how there's going to be a problem in the environmental effects. But we think that extraction is going to bring a benefit because it's going to bring down the price of fossil fuels. Because currently, few production markets are currently dominated by countries in OPEC, such as Qatar and Indonesia. We think that this is a problem because the monopolization of OPEC results in the high dictation of price at a high value. And we think that this is the cartel behavior of OPEC, which is setting unreasonable prices for oil. And this is why developing countries cannot access the resources like fossil fuels. We think that when we let countries like America, Russia, and Canada to access those resources in the Arctic, we're basically increasing new actors in the market, which is making sure that the cost is going to be decreased by increasing the, pop, the supply and allowing us to break the cartel value. We think that when we do extract the resources, we are affording the moral responsibility of ensuring that those people in their energy poverty are not going to suffer. So for all these reasons, the motion falls. Thank you. to understand how sincere, seriously severe the situation really is. In my speech today, after I yelled to the inherent harms to the drilling in the Arctic, I'm going to show you that we have plenty of other alternatives that are going to actually answer the, the so-called necessity side of position strike the group. I will be talking in my speech about, first of all, alternative materials we can use as a substitute for what, uh, what we have in the Arctic, and secondly, alternative places we can get them from. But first, let me give you some few data. We heard that the need is very urgent for third world countries like China and India to depend on these excellent resources. First of all, we say that China gets most of its oil actually from the Persian Gulf. So they are not exactly a country that we can say absolutely depends on the Arctic. But as it comes to other third world countries, we have actually two, uh, three answers to that. First of all, we are willing to to let them know a year before we're stopping the drilling in the Arctic so that they can prepare their economies as much as necessary. Secondly, we're willing to send economic aid to countries that need it, need it in, order, in order for them to be able to deal with the consequences of what we're trying to do. Thirdly, the harm to the economy um, isn't nearly as important as the harm to the environment that I'm going to talk, uh, talk to later on about how inherent it is and I was never answered by the side opposition. Fourthly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it, we have enough reserves to get those economies going until they, are, they adjust their economies to our reform, as I will talk to speak about in my speech. Secondly, we heard that renewable energy is not ready yet. yet. We have reserves 
until it will be ready if we use the maximum amount of uh, renewable energy by the year of 2040. It's going to be able to cover for most of the world's um, uh, energy needs. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, we have other alternatives such as a nuclear power that we'll talk about in my speech and natural gas that we can use. But let me t t tell you about, uh, t talk to you about some of the things that will never add to this position. We heard that we can have regulations that somehow will help us prevent all the inherent harms presented. But first of all, in order to have regulations that will actually prevent all chances of oil dripping, which is, by the way, not as I told you, sucks into the ice. No, it sucks into the surface of water under the ice and has to be there for a year since in the winter until the summer where we can actually clean it. Secondly, Okay. If we want to actually have the infrastructure needed, it is inherent to that infrastructure that it will harm the environment. Because we're going to need space, we're going to need to take the trees off, we're going to have to take off the, the territories of animals and of indigenous communities. But this was never answered by some opposition. Thirdly, we never answered the analysis our first speaker gave about how drilling for natural gas, will in, uh, for oil, sorry, will, uh, will inherently release natural gas that we're going to have to deal with. And will increase ice melting. We are aware that ice melting is a, a sorry comes from global warming, but we will be dealing with this in two ways. First of all, we're going to minimize uh, we're going to minimize the effects of this because global warming is not the only thing that's causing it. Drilling causes that too. And secondly, since we are uh, we're supporting moving to renewable energy sources, uh, global warming will substantially decrease as a result. Now let me move on to my success. Uh, my point. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. Yes, for something. Eighty-four percent of undiscovered oil and gas reserves are in the Arctic region. How will drilling pose a significant harm? Thank you. First of all, the fact that there's supposedly a lot of oil in the Arctic does not mean that drilling will not cause significant harm. Secondly, this data is just not correct. Actually, there is far more oil in South America, for example, than in the Arctic. The Arctic does not hold the majority of the world's oil. That's a lie. Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, we have three alternatives to oil. Natural gas. Natural gas is a good substitute for oil. It covers from most of its uses, primarily fuels. Um, there's a lot of natural gas in the Arctic, we cannot get to it because the infrastructure needed is not economically beneficial for the companies building in the Arctic to achieve. Luckily, there is no shortage of natural gas in the world today. In fact, we just discovered vast amounts of natural gas in the Levant Basin. Uh, this discovery has been called, and I quote, the most significant discovery in noble gas history by the CEO of Nobel Energy Center. It has supposed that it, it, it estimates show that it has 100 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, covering for most of the world's needs, at least for the past for the next few years. This gas is significantly more accessible than the gas in the Arctic, as we don't have to drill through sheets of ice in order to get to it. And we have urban cities next to it in civilized countries such as Cyprus and Israel that are, are capable of serving the purposes of having the infrastructure needed on them to process the gas and to use it. Secondly, we're talking about nuclear energy. This kind of nuclear energy, uh, energy is far more environmentally friendly yeah. because it does not involve the release of the very harmful uh, uh, pollutants that cause A, global warming, and B, air pollution that leads to disease in all civilized countries, ladies and gentlemen. Nuclear power does not continuously harm the environment all the time. Yes, we are aware that, 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 we, uh, that we have the nuclear waste, but we, the world is able to deal with it. You know what the world is not able to deal with? The pollutants. We don't have any way to deal with them yet. And this is something that the position needs to answer. Actually, nu nuclear power plants provided 30% of the world's electricity in 2012. And European countries, such as France and Germany, have been using the uh, 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 Thank you. Uh, we've been getting the majority of their energy for the past few years from nuclear energy. So this is a, a, a viable alternative. So the we'll be discussing renewable energy. Solar energy, wind energy, water power, and bioenergy are all green alternatives, which does absolutely no harm to the environment. And they told us that it is climate dependent, but we're saying that most of these renewable sources we're talking about are actually biofuel, which can be transmitted from place to place. 
Okay, it currently cons um, consists of 60% of, uh, of the world's energy consumption, and the use is going to be year by year, for, year by year. For example, um, the, wind, uh, wind, uh, the usage of wind energy has been increasing 20% every year for the past 10 years. Brazil, for example, 25% um, of Brazil's automobile fuel comes from green energy. So what we want to hear from side opposition is that why renewable energy, causing far less harm to the environment, is not sufficient because uh, while we have the reserves to get to it and to develop it in the next few years without drilling in the Arctic, we want to hear from side opposition why it is justified to inherently hurt A, indigenous communities, B, the biodiversity in the Arctic, and C, and most importantly, and we think, with no doubt, this alone means the debate, the rising sea levels that will lead to countries going underwater. Um, so I've shown you that there are many alternatives. The opposition to win this debate has to tell us why these are not viable alternatives that can be used. And for this reason, ladies and gentlemen, I beg you to propose. Um, first of all, the, the consequence of nuclear waste is way more 
detrimental than car uh, than carbon if we want to compare how the radiation leaks and the potential that it can cost the environment takes over a hundred years to get rid to get to get rid of. But, and, and there hasn't been a method and a way to actually solve that problem yet. But under our case, um, we have shown new cases where technology has been improving and actually trying to capture these uh, carbon emissions to actually uh, and uh, regulating um, so that we can actually reduce the amount of emissions. And you know, that's my next trip on how if you move, they talk about how to use, there's enough reserves in society, so there's no need to export resources in the Arctic. But if we think that there's two different things between having reserve and actually having access to it. Because OPEC is dominating these resources, they're having a cartel, so they're setting prices at too high of a price and they're not willing to share it with other countries. So the thing is that in order to actually in, uh, increase the access for China to have these resources, we need to introduce other actors into this, into, into this market so that OPEC can reduce the supplies in order to compete with, uh, in order to compete and actually be able to make money. And in order to do that, we need to allow these countries such as USA and Russia and Canada to be involved in the market. And to do that, we have to export these resources so that OPEC will lower the price and China can get these resources. Yeah. Now to my last... Uh, um, I'm not going to go into my argument, but before, yes. The infrastructure involved in drilling in the Arctic is so expensive that any oil that's actually extracted from there is going to be 35% more expensive than the oil. That is not true. It's not. It's not more expensive. And of course, companies will think about if, if it's if the cost is too high, they won't be exporting. Because right now there are test runs and there are test drives to make sure that the uh, that the cost is is worth it for them to sell. And sec and second of all, we have already told you about conventional drilling. That is a way cheaper uh, a cheaper process than the and then um, common process they are using right now for such fracking. But onto my argument on how green energy in China and India isn't an option right now. Because first of all, the cost. Developing countries cannot afford the cost of developing new, uh, new, uh, renewable energy because with solar power being at least four times more costly than fossil fuels. One great example of this is the high cost is more evident uh, in developed countries such as Germany. Germany has spent over 100 billion euros on solar power panels than any other countries in Europe. But in recent months, two important um, Germany solar manufacturers have gone bankrupt. Secondly, uh, second of all, uh, renewable energy is inefficient because um, the fossil fuel, um, um, because we understand that renewable energy is, is limited, where all types of energy generally depend on where the weather is consistent and where solar energy can all work at night at all. And even in winter months, uh, the, and when there's not enough sunlight, they can't even produce enough electricity. electricity. So more specifically, these types of energy, such as solar energy, will only result in low energy production. Because only 22% of the sun's energy can be converted into electrical energy. Let's say it applies to windmills that only operate at 40% egg maximum. Well, com compared to the production level of coal, is 90% efficiency. We cannot risk another generation being excluded out of energy, especially when energy is pre a prerequisite to basic human rights. With moreover, we cannot risk another incident of how low supply like India's blackout in July last year, where 700 million people, people were left to live without electricity because they failed to meet the energy demand. So, uh, I'll please sit down. Even developed countries like Germany have trouble with renewable energy and in terms of efficiency, where they are short of power. This creates a difficult in supply and energy research means where it would be more impossible for countries like China to bring power to 300 million people using energy. Now, on to my next uh, argument on the idea of how um, extraction reasons will not deter innovation towards green energy because we believe that there is a political will for these uh, countries uh, to actually further continue to uh, research in uh, green new, uh, renewable energy because at the end of the day we want to move towards that. Because there is the European Green Party in the European Union where they help create regulations in the form of policy that contributes to this stance. And there's also profit motives of companies because companies are building climate protection into images in their bottom line, such as Toyota, Nike, and IKEA. Because these companies recognize that sustainability is not optional, and that the energy problem is not going to go away, and that market demand for highly efficient, uh, 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 efficient energy is there. So this is why the, the companies will also have the incentive to actually further invest in new renewable energy. And also we talked about how there's also increased environmental regulations, such as countries like Australia, where they have the cap and trade system to ensure to, uh, to reduce the uh, pollution, regulatory pollution. And we, and we also say that only after when we allow these developing countries to actually have enough energy to provide for their people, only then can they focus on actually uh, actually focus on renewable energy. Because I told you that one, the harms and risks are mitigated. And even if there is a risk, um, uh, we should focus on more important things like the people who have uh, energy.
by the third speaker on the proposition. Ladies and gentlemen, today's debate is about balance. Today's debate is about the question of whether the possible and slight harm of uh, to, the, to these developing countries is worth the definite and serious damage both to the environment, to the indigenous population, and to the world, uh, and, and to the people of the world. And we say that without a doubt, we take today's debate. I will be explaining this in three main areas. First of all, I will be talking about the inherent harms to the region. Second of all, I'll be, uh, I'll be asking the question, can, we, can these harms really be mitigated? And thirdly, I'll be, uh, I'll be talking about our alternatives for developing countries. So, let's begin with the first one, and that is Because we got up here and told you today that there are three main and serious harms that happen with, 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 because of this film. We told you that first of all, there is a serious harm to the environment. Environment that is so rich and so uh, and so diverse. Environment of this uh, this place, which is so different than anywhere else, that is that is so important to us that we cannot ignore it and we cannot just be egotistical and greedy and take the oath. But second of all, and more importantly, we told you that there is a great harm to coastal countries. We explained to you that when you when you drill for gas and the natural gas that we cannot actually extract from the Arctic because it is too expensive and therefore we have to burn off. When we do that, there is soot that covers the ice and that significantly increases the, the melting of the ice. We explain, no thank you, we are not talking about global warming here. While we agree that global warming is a problem and of course we would like to mitigate it as much as possible, this is not what we are discussing today. What we are discussing is the fact that this very, very quickly increases the melting of the ice and that at current rates there will be countries, there will be thousands and thousands of people displaced in countries like Ni Nigeria within 25 years. We say that this is not an exaggerated thing and merely a fact that currently sea levels are rising far, far too quickly. But, and thirdly, we told you that there, that there are indigenous, that there is an indigenous population here. That there are people that have time and time again requested and demanded that their countries not let the oil, the oil companies come in and take away everything that they, uh, that they work for and, you, and not harm their environment. These harms are serious and important and we think that alone they win today's debate. Because even if even if these developing countries need cheaper oil, even if this yeah. is a problem of thinking, we say that it is not okay to to put their priorities above the priorities of all the people that will be harming the country's proposition. Yeah. Thank you. And then now let me move on to the second question. That is, can these harms be mitigated? Because they told us uh, they told us two things. They told us first of all that this harm uh, that that this kind of drilling in, in extreme places have been done already, and we say that, that these are nowhere near no, thank you, as extreme conditions. The Arctic is a very, very unique place, as our first speaker detailed to you, and was never properly answered. But so, and second of all, they told us that there is monetary and international pressure to not um, have oil spills, etc., etc. And we say that despite this, we explain to you that, for instance, Shell, which is doing exploratory drilling right now, has completely, and, and who thought and passed all the regulations that they would, were Arctic ready, still completely failed to keep their rigs afloat, still completely failed to, uh, to have any proper way of of yeah. answering, I'll take a second, of answering an oil spill if it were to happen. A February 2012 report shows us that they, there's not enough infrastructure there, that there's not enough, um, that there aren't enough places to house the people under there. There is enough scientific data to know how to how to clean up the oil spill if it were to happen. Yes, ma'am. In Australia, only with the mining that the Aboriginal communities actually got jobs. This is what we're doing in the Archer region, especially when those people have really low life expectancy and can't even afford food. Except that these Aboriginal people themselves have been the ones that are requesting these people move out. You can't just claim that it's helping them if they themselves are telling us that it's not. I think we should believe that. Okay? But more importantly than this, we're talking about the melting deaths, we're talking about oil spills, we're talking about the damage not only to the Aborigines, but to the but to the worldwide but to the world. And we say that th these harms cannot be mitigated. We, neither, we have neither the infrastructure nor the scientific data to do this. Is, this was detailed by our first and second speakers and never properly answered by the other side. But now let's move on to the third question. And that is our alternatives for developing countries. They told us 
that the, that oil is far far too expensive and that it, and that it needs to be cheaper. And to so this, we told you one. Thing. We told you first of all that the fact of the matter is that because it is so expensive to drill in the Arctic, this oil is expected to be sold at 35 percent the normal price. They claim this was a lie, and I guess that's it because it's a fact debate. But at the end of the day, we detail to you why it's so expensive. Why is the, the, these extreme conditions? requires such complicated infrastructure, infrastructure that isn't there yet. And that is why this yeah. oil, I think, will, will, will be sold. And that's why there will not be cheap oil on this. But more than this, ladies and gentlemen, we gave you four very important and very serious alternatives that together are going to solve the problem. We told you, first of all, that there are vast places of natural gas that are untapped. We told you this is the, the, the Levant Basin. We told you that, 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 in fact, there are many places of the world. This alternative was never answered by the other side. It has none of the harms that they've been talking about. And we say that it's a very important one that is currently not being used and should be used first before we go on. We, they told us, second of all, uh, we told you, second of all, that we should be using nuclear energy. And while, yes, it is harmful, it is significantly less harmful than these fossil fuels. Because at the end of the day, this disease and radiation that does also exist in fossil fuels is a lot less yeah. when it comes to nuclear energy. No, thank you. And thirdly, we told you about renewable energy. And yes, while we recognize that this is not a viable option for all countries, we say we should be putting it into places that it is, and more importantly, developing it and, and helping them develop it until while our oil runs out until the point in time where they can use it. And fourthly, we told you that there is oil in many other places. We told you that there is oil in, for instance, South America. In fact, South America holds approximately 30% of the oil results of the world. That's triple that of what there is in the Arctic. And we said that we should be tapping that before we go anywhere else. This, again, was never properly answered. So we say, because we have oil that's going to last us for so long, oil is expected, even if we don't tap all those things, to last for at least another 40 years, and that's plenty of time to develop our green energy and to make sure that these developing countries that so need this energy get it. We say, and because oil isn't going to be cheaper, but on the other hand, what we've explained to you is that there's serious harm to the indigenous people, to the environment, and most importantly, to the people in Nigeria and in the Netherlands that are going to to be over, to, going to be flooded very, very quickly. Even if 25 years sounds like a long time to some people, we know that it's very, very clearly not. We say we cannot stand the harm rate. We say that, that our alternatives are certainly more than enough. And at the end of the day, when we look at the balance, we clearly win today's debate. Thank you. Thank you. that around 1.7 billion individuals, which accounts for almost one-third of the world's population, do not have access to a basic electricity supply. 80% of these people are rurally based, and almost 99% live in developing countries. With no electricity, we see that in this country's water does not come from tap, and the water that these people drink comes from rivers. And drinking polluted river water often brings diseases that kill 4 million people a year. We think this is enough justification to, I mean, that the opposition has brought to you today to, to prove to you how there is this dire need to address this idea of this problem of the energy crisis. We see that people in developing countries, they do not have access to electricity, they do not have, have access to energy. We think this is the main problem that we have to address. All these problems about environments, we think that it's in the long run, that will be addressed further on. But right now, the, the most important immediate problem we have to look at is the fact that people are dying because they do not have electricity electricity, power, th things that we take for granted, that millions of people in, the, in developing countries do not have. So now, moving, moving on to my first issue, I have three issues to, to present to you today on how opposition side has really taken this debate from the start. Now first of all, on, on how is there really an environmental harm? First of all, they came out and talked about how there's this responsibility to protect the environment. Well, first of all, we've really come out, come out and proven to you that companies really have the incentive to protect the environment. Because we see we really gave you and gave the example, came out and gave the example of the BP oil spill, how BP had to pay four billion dollars and just to, just for as a fine yeah. and fourteen additional billion dollars to clean up the mess. We think this is already a clear example in the status quo that companies will have to pay for accidents that they cause. We think this is a good enough deterrent for companies in the future to take care and adhere, adhere to regulations when they go drilling in the Arctic. Yeah. And also we really came out and talked to you about how this is political will and how technology has really advanced to the level where, where all these harms, all these crimes, all these accidents can be mitigated. We think at the end of the day, propositions 
that has not proven to you how it is justified that we let the people in South America go on in their lives without energy and it, they insist on, pro on protecting Inuit. So moving on to the second issue, how they talk about how there's a harm of human population. On the first contention, right, they talk about how you need to protect the vulnerable and therefore you want to turn to alternative energy. Well, first of all, we really came out and proven to you that alternative energy cannot be used because it is not ready. You see, the problem with this is that people do not have access to electricity. And because they don't have electricity, because the access to electricity is a prerequisite to human rights, as my first speaker has really told you, we really proved to you how there's a correlation between energy access and human rights. Right? We don't think that propositions are actually attack that point. We don't think they're happy to engage on that point. We also we have also proven to you that many that because water purification systems also run on energy, we think it is essential that we address this idea of an energy yeah. crisis. We say 1.5 million people die from diarrhea every year. And because this is something that people should not die from, because it's easily preventable, it can be easily cured. We say improper sewage due to energy crisis due to lack of energy, has made this health crisis. Because we think this is a huge concern that we have to address, we think propositions that has not engaged on this yeah. issue. Second of all, we've really proven to you how we allow for these vulnerable people to have access to energy. Right? We see under our model, we attach this condition to the license for you to drill in the Arctic, that you have to fund local infrastructure, you have to provide jobs with in indigenous people. We say we've really proven, given these companies the obligation to provide those in indigenous people. Before I move on to my second question, can you please explain why we can't use, for instance, natural gas instead of the soil? You, sure, we want to use natural gas. Sure, it, we think that natural gas can be taken from the uh, Arctic, right? We think. Uh, uh, okay, okay. You want to. What propositions that Kian talk, talk to you about? You want to turn to alternative energy. You don't want to export anything from the Arctic. And then it came out and talked to you about how you want, why not take natural gas. If you want to take natural gas, you want to use all these non renewable resources, sure, go ahead. We've really proven to you in today's debate why the harm that are today, why the benefits of doing so outweighs the harms. Now, moving on to the second contention on the idea of how they talk about indigenous people and how they talk about how these people do not want to move and do not want to change, right? We think that propositions that have not proven how they're going to increase the standard of life for all these indigenous, indigenous people. And, the problem, and we, we really came out and proven to you that in our model, as I told you before, we, we, uh, we force the companies to, to in, uh, invest in local infrastructure and eventually help all these Inuit people transition to a more modern society. Because you see that under our model, when, when we start to export these natural resources, we bring industry into the region, we bring money into the region, we eventually create jobs for all these people, and after they we essentially increase the standard of living. Yeah. And we see that because they have, we have to move anyway, because we see that both sides really conceded that global warming is an issue, that at the end of the day, these new people would have to move. We said what matters is which side helps them best, right, and, and helps them to adapt this issue. We think on the proposition side, they have failed to tell you and prove to you how they're going to help these indigenous people adapt to these changes. And we really come and prove it to you based on our model, that even if they don't want, we really prove to you how we do not, we're not going to risk three million lives just because they do not want to move, just because they want to continue to fish. And going on to the third contention under this point, on how to talk about how animals are being harmed. I think that animals in the Arctic are doing pretty well, right? Because even the rarest whale species population went from 45 whales to 420 whales. And therefore, this proves that there's no significant harm to these animals at the end of the day. And, uh, and also, moving on to the fourth contention, on how the third speaker came out and talked and gave her, gave you her speech. And from the speech, we derived that she's actually willing to let the South American population suffer and they're trying to protect the Inuit population. We said that the, the, the problem right now, the problem we have to address right now is the energy crisis and not the environment. Because the environment problem is in the long term, we can address that later. And moreover, we've really proven to you that how we end up today on our model, we think that because technology is so much more advanced, we don't think that energy is going to be a great environmental harm. And we want to the third, on, on the third level. Um, how they talk about how we're going to leave people suffering. And first of all, they cannot talk and explain to you how alternative energy is, is, going, to, is going to actually provide energy for all these people. And you can give you the example of Brazil and how 35% of the energy comes from alternative energy. Well, look, Brazil recently had an energy crisis. They had blackouts the whole day, and then people had to suffer. And why is this? Because alternative energy is so unreliable. We said, first of all, alternative energy is inefficient. Second of all, it's high cost. We think it's extremely expensive to build things like wind turbines and solar panels, especially in developing countries. 
Third of all, we say it cannot be deployed, and often energy cannot de be deployed. And therefore, we've really proven to you that because of all these harms we see from coming from alternative energy, because we see that alternative energy is not ready, we, we don't actually, because we've really proven to you that there is this need to exploit resources. We think that on, on the outside, we allow for developing countries to have better access to all these energy resources, right? Because under our model, we say when, when other or the five Arctic nations, when they come up like US and Russia, when you increase the supply of the natural resources, we think it decreases the price of these natural resources. And out of that, it will increase, the, it will make access of all these natural resources easier for all these developing countries. We think at the end of the day, we solve the biggest problem at hand, which is the energy crisis. We think a proposition that has failed to engage on this, on this issue, they have failed to actually prove to us how they're going to solve the energy crisis. So if the opposition side has proven to you that first of all, we and we we have really proven to you how we're going to solve this idea of the energy crisis. We have proven to you that how it's in with people, and at the end of the day, we are we, we actually have, uh, we are the side that helps in transition, that helps in adapt. We have also proven to you that on, on our side, our model will adapt and allow for the rest of the world to have the energy they so desperately need the motion as well. So we would that any way people are going to be satisfied with our mechanism. And we think that they are, because what we're doing is that we're introducing a political will to actually develop infrastructure and introduce and introduce jobs for them, which is going to improve their standard of living. We think that on side proposition, they don't care about those anyway people because they don't solve for those problems in the region. But moving on to the second the second actor in this debate, on the idea of these coastal people. Because they told you how this is going to lead to flooding from the Arctic. We don't think that we don't think that this is going to be a big issue because the reason that there is flooding is because of an increase of temperature. We told you on our side is that it's going to happen in both paradigms because we think that pollution is actually the cause of this type of uh, of this type of problem. And this is exactly why we need that there are certain mechanisms that we can take in order to tackle this long-term solution at the end of the day. But moving on to the third actor, because we think that there are people currently in energy poverty. We told you that these are people who don't have access to food or clean water simply because they don't have electricity. And we don't see how side proposition has solved for this because they never responded to this idea on how renewable energy cannot be an alternative for people in developing countries simply because they don't have the money to do so and simply because there's not enough efficiency for those countries. So moving on to this idea of renewable energy, because we told you that first of all, there's this idea of high expensive costs. We told you that Solyndra in the United States, even if, with the subsidy, what happened was the company went bankrupt. It shows that this is an example of how there's going to be high costs associated with this type of energy, but also because of this type of inefficiency. We told you how in Germany, they, they can't generate enough energy simply because on short over past winter days, it means that there's not enough, uh, there's not enough, um, it means that there's not enough sun in order to ensure that energy is going to be go going towards the population. We think that this is why the cost of investment by developing countries is not going to be sustainable. Because it means that what happens is that we cannot provide enough energy to those people. So we think that on side proposition, they're basically condemning more people to death because they don't care about those people who don't have access to renewable energy or any other forms of energy. But then they told you about this idea of nuclear energy. We don't think that nuclear energy is a point in this debate because we think that it's even harder to clean up when we talk about the radiation. We think that the BP oil spill actually only took 76 days, but with nuclear energy, if a nuclear spill happens, it means that it's going to take decades. And this is why we think that because it is so dangerous, we don't see how this is going to be an alternative option. But last of all, they talked about this environmental harm. We think that we already provided an analysis on how this can be mitigated on our side. When we talk about ice rows in Alaska or directional drilling, which is not going to hurt the ice. It means that we have already made sure that there's not there's going to be environmentally friendly, that we're not going to affect the ice or affect the natural environment. We told you that companies are going to have a calculated risk because they learn from the BP oil spill, but they also learn from their mistakes simply because they don't want to pay the price of an environmental cost which is so high. We also told you that there's a political will because there's lobby in all countries in order to make sure that oil drilling is going to be environmentally friendly. We think that the only response from government was this idea of shell, which we don't see is in this debate. We told you that there's not going to be an environmental cost to the motion. Well, thank you. I'm going to talk about two issues to summarize this debate. First of all, what's more urgent, the oil crisis or the environmental crisis? And secondly, the effect this will have on third world countries. We, we are aware of the fact that for high school kids, 25 years might look like a, uh, like a long-term problem. But I'm sure the fellow judges and all the audience in the room is aware of the fact that 25 years is now. 
The environmental crisis we have right now is burning us. The Netherlands are at risk of going underwater. And we showed you that it is inherent to the situation that um, more natural gas will be released and more icebergs will melt. This was never answered by side um, opposition. All we heard is that, yes, it comes from global warming, but it also comes from this and we want to minimize it. They told us that there is no way for us to use our alternatives. We give you four different alternatives. We give you natural gas from other places, not from the Arctic, not from the Arctic. We're talking about the Levant Basin, talking about Europe, talking about all those other places in the world who have, that have natural gas. We told you nuclear energy. They told us it is somehow more difficult to clean than nuclear waste. This is simply not true. Right now, in the Arctic water, there are still pollutants. There's still oil from the Luxon uh, leaking 35 years ago. How is that easy to clean? Thirdly, we gave you oil from South America, which was never answered. And fourthly, renewable energy, they did answer, but we have a problem with their answer, because they're claiming that the renewable energy will never be able to suffice for all for the entire world. Yes, we're aware of that, but you know what can be satisfactory for the entire world? Oil. We need all of those alternatives combined to have a solution. And this was never answered by side opposition. Also, we heard that renewable energies cost a lot of money because oil controls the market. But this happens because oil controls the market right now. When we stop exploiting for oil, oil will not control the market. Renewable energies will be cheaper because more people will use them. That's how the market works. Also, they never answered our uh, entire claim that because Arctic uh, is such a problematic region, it will increase oil prices in 35%. How will third world countries be able to deal with that? And this leads you to third world countries that we will be able to deal with the situation. They talk about China and India. Both countries export most of their oil from the Parisian Gulf and do not stand in front of a political conflict in that matter. But secondly, we're saying that we, in case they do need financial aid, we have many solutions. We, have, we can give them actual financial aid. We can give them renewable energy sources. We can support them in this process. And it was never explained from opposition. Why if we drill in the Arctic, it will lead to benefit to benefit from these countries? Because we think it's the problem of the government. Right now, these countries have oil. What do they do? They don't use it properly. We're giving them more energy sources. We're giving them nuclear energy. We're giving them alternative oil from South America for the beginning. We're giving them renewable sources of energy, such as, such as wind, solar energy, and uh, water energy. And we're giving them natural gas. All of those can actually satisfy the needs of those countries when it comes to electricity and when it comes to medicine. So what did we hear from side opposition today? They had two burdens. First of all, to show us that the damage they're causing is far greater. But we showed you, first of all, the alternatives these countries have, and second of all, the far greater damage of countries going underwater in 25 years, not a long-term damage, in our opinion. We gave you the second damage of, uh, of the biodiversity in the Arctic, which was never, uh, um, and we believe that these uh, damages are far greater than the ones we can actually do. The environment, has an alternative, and this is why we're begging for the